Hi, this is Wendy Lightheart, and in this video we're going to be talking about angles. First, what is an angle? Well, simply put, it's a rotation. So let's start by talking about the different parts of an angle. We have first the vertex, which is the part of the angle that is fixed. It's the part that doesn't move. Then we have the initial side, where the angle starts. Then we have the rotation that makes the angle and the terminal side where the angle ends. And then we have our angle. So you can visualize the rotation there by this red arrow and how far the angle rotates would be our measure. So we have the vertex, the initial side, and the terminal side. That makes up our angle. Now, oftentimes we will refer to an angle in its standard position. What does that mean? Well, to be in the standard position, the vertex will be located at the origin on an XY plane. And the initial side will be placed on the positive X axis. Oftentimes we won't actually draw in the initial side, but it will be presumed to be the positive X axis. And then, depending on the measure of the angle, the terminal side can land on any of the four quadrants that we have here. This one happens to land in the second quadrant. Hopefully you remember how we name the four quadrants from algebra. We have quadrant one, we have quadrant two, quadrant three, and quadrant four. A counterclockwise rotation indicates a positive angle measure. A clockwise rotation indicates a negative angle measure. This angle in the second quadrant that we see here could be named with a positive angle measure, but also with a negative angle measure. This is what we call angles that are coterminal. In other words, two angles with the same initial and terminal sides are said to be coterminal. So they may have two different angle measures, but they're essentially the same angle because they have the same initial side and the same terminal side. And this angle actually has infinitely many coterminal angles associated with it. Because essentially we could rotate full rotations around and then as long as we end with the same terminal side, that angle would be coterminal with the angle that we see here. Now we have two common units to measure angles that we'll talk about here today. We have degrees and radians. And first we're going to focus on degrees. You are probably more familiar with degrees. So let's first look at how we use degrees on the coordinate system. On the initial side here, the positive x-axis, if there is no rotation, then we would say that is an angle of zero degrees. Then a full rotation would be an angle of 360 degrees. So zero degrees is coterminal with 360 degrees because they share the same initial and terminal side. The other quadrantal angles are 90 degrees, 180 degrees, and 270 degrees. We call them quadrantal angles because their terminal side happens to fall on one of the axes, the x-axis or the y-axis. So 90 degrees falls up here on the positive y-axis. So if we rotate from the positive x-axis 90 degrees counterclockwise, then we land on the positive y-axis. Then if we rotate another 90 degrees, which would be 180 degrees total, we'll land on the negative x-axis. If we rotate another 90 degrees for a total of 270 degrees, we'll land on the negative y-axis. And then we come back to the 360 degree rotation, which will take us back to the positive x-axis. So those are the quadrantal angles and they split up the 
coordinate system up into our quadrants. That's why we call them quadrantal angles. Now where will the terminal side of the angle 135 degrees fall? So remember that the initial side will always start at the positive x-axis. And since this is a positive angle, we would rotate counterclockwise. And we want to rotate 135 degrees. So imagine you're rotating in that direction and you want to go past 90 degrees because 135 is bigger than 90. But you don't want to go too far past 180 degrees because that would be too big of a number. So somewhere between 90 and 180, right? And there's 90 degrees between those two numbers. And the difference between 90 and 135 is 45 degrees, which happens to be halfway between 90 and 180. So that's where 135 would fall, halfway between 90 and 180 degrees. So this is how we would draw that angle. And notice I didn't have to draw the initial side. Often we don't necessarily draw out the initial side. We can merely indicate that angle with its terminal side. Where would the terminal side of the angle negative 30 degrees fall? So remember for a negative angle, we will rotate in the clockwise direction starting with the positive x-axis. And if we want to go negative 30 degrees, this quadrant is 90 degrees total, right, in this fourth quadrant. And 30 degrees would be a third of that. So imagine rotating a third of the way down into that quadrant. And that will be where negative 30 degrees will be located. Okay, now let's talk about the other units to measure angles, which is radians. So our initial side, positive x-axis, if we don't rotate at all, this is where zero radians would be located. But let's first define what a radian is, because you may not have heard or understood what a radian is exactly, like you do degrees. So here we have a circle, and we have a central angle, as you hopefully have learned about in geometry. And you'll notice that we have a radius marked here with an R to indicate its length, and another radius with an R here. And we also have an arc that the central angle is intercepting, and it's also indicated with an R. So the way we define a radian is that a central angle has a measure of one radian if the length of the arc it intercepts is equal to the radius of the circle. Okay, so if we make that angle just big enough so that the arc that that angle intercepts is the same length as the radius of the circle, then the measure of that angle, the size of that rotation, will be one radian. So that's what a radian is. Okay, so how many radians do you think it would take to make a full rotation all the way around the circle? Well, if you think about it this way, what if we wanted to make a full rotation around the edge of the circle? We wanted to make this arc not the length of one radius, but we wanted to make it the full distance around the circle. How many multiples of r would that take? Well, we're really talking about the full circumference of a circle, right? That's what the distance around a circle is called, the circumference. If you remember the formula for the circumference of a circle, that is 2 pi times r. So we would have to multiply this r times 2 pi. So if we wanted to do the same thing for the central angle, if we wanted to multiply that central angle by something to make it go all the way around the circle, to rotate all the way around the circle, we could do the same thing. We could take this one radian and multiply it by 2 pi. That's how many radians it would take to make a full rotation. 2 pi times 1 radian, which is 2 pi radians. So those would be co-terminal angles, 0 radians or 2 pi radians. Now what about each of the quadrantal angles measured in radians? So let's look at, not up here at the 
top of the y-axis, but how about looking at the negative side of the x-axis instead, because that would be a half of rotation, right? That would be like going half of the way around the circle. And if one full rotation is 2 pi, then half of a rotation would be half of that, and half of 2 pi would be 1 pi. Okay, so then going back up here to the top of the y-axis, if this half of a rotation is 1 pi, then up here would have to be half of that, right? So half of pi would be pi over 2. Let's start back here at 0 again. We have 0, then we have half of pi, 1 pi, and then we would add another half to get back down here. So that would be 1 and a half of pi. 1 and a half of pi would be 3 halves of pi, or 3 pi over 2. So those are our quadrantal angles in terms of pi, measured in radians. Okay, so let's talk about special angles. We have some special angles that we will be learning a lot about in trig that we'll be applying our trig functions to. And so let's first look at these special angles on our coordinate system in degrees, and then we will look at the same special angles in radians. Now, the first ones we want to look at are the multiples of 45 degrees. And remember, we talked about previously how each quadrant has 90 degrees in it, and half of 90 degrees is 45 degrees. So the multiples of 45 degrees are going to be splitting up the quadrants in half. So that's how you can easily identify where those special angles are placed. And I've darkened those terminal sides to help you see those a little bit better. And the first one, starting with our initial side at 0 degrees, if we rotate 45 degrees in the counterclockwise direction, that's going to be 45 degrees in the first quadrant. And if we rotate 45 degrees, we end up at 90. Then we rotate another 45 degrees, we end at 135. That's the multiple of 45 degrees in the second quadrant. Then another 45 degrees, we end up at 180. Add another 45 degrees, and we have two, 225 in the third quadrant. Another 45 degrees lands at 270. Another 45 degrees, and we have 315 degrees. And then another 45 degrees, we end at 360. So those are the multiples of 45 degrees in our coordinate system here, between 0 and 360. Next, we have the multiples of 30 degrees. So all of our quadrantal angles are multiples of 30 degrees, and then we have some other angles inside the quadrants that are also multiples of 30 degrees. Now the first multiple of 30 we have after starting at 0 degrees in the first quadrant, 30 degrees. Then we rotate another 30 degrees and we land at 60 degrees. Rotate another 30 degrees and we have 90 degrees and then another 30 degrees, we have 120 degrees. Rotate another 30 degrees and we have 150 degrees. Then we have 180 degrees. Another 30 degrees from that will give us 210 degrees. Another 30 degrees gives us 240 degrees. Another 30 degrees gives us 270 degrees. And then we have 300 degrees, 330 degrees, and then another 30 degrees would land us back where we started, or at 360 degrees for a full rotation. So there we have all of these special angles between 0 and 360 degrees. Now let's look at these in radians. So we have 0, and then we can look at the multiples of pi over 4 from 0. So the first one would be pi over 4, and that is equivalent to 45 degrees. And we'll soon look at how to convert between the two different units. For now, think about, uh, think about it this way. The halfway between half of pi and 0 would be a quarter of pi, right? And then after a half of pi, if we go another quarter of pi from there, that would give us three quarters of pi. So we're really just 
cutting up these quadrants or this um, circle into quarters. That's an easy way to think about it. And then we rotate another quarter of pi to give us a full pi. And then another quarter of pi will give us one and a fourth pi or five fourths a pi. And then add another quarter of pi to one and a quarter pi would give us one and a half pi, which is three halves pi. Add another quarter of pi to one and a half pi and you have one and three quarters pi, which is equivalent to seven fourths a pi. Add another quarter of pi to seven fourths and you have eight fourths of pi, which brings us back to two pi. So those are the one fourths of pi that we have between zero and two pi. Next, we have the multiples of pi over six or one sixth of pi, starting with one sixth of pi. If we add another sixth of pi to that, this would give us two sixths of pi, or equivalently one third of pi. Add another sixth of that, and that would give you three sixths of pi, which is equivalent to one half of pi. And then add one sixth to three sixths, that would give you four sixths of pi, or in other words, two thirds of pi. And then four sixths plus one sixth would be five sixths of pi. And five six plus one six would be six six of pi, which is a full pi. Six six plus one six would be seven six of pi. If we add one six to that, that would give us eight six of pi, which reduces to four thirds of pi. And eight six of pi plus one six of pi would be nine six of pi, which reduces to three halves of pi. And nine six of pi plus one six of pi would be ten six of pi, which reduces to five thirds of pi. And one more six of pi added to 10 six of pi would give us 11 six of pi. And if we add one six more to that, that would give us 12 six of pi, which is two pi. So those are all of the special angles in radians, which are all fractions of pi. Now let's talk about converting between degrees and radians. So remember that 180 degrees is a half of a rotation and pi radians is also a half of a rotation. So these are equivalent to each other. They're just different units to measure the angle in. And since these are equal to each other, we can use this as a conversion fact in addition to the method of dimensional analysis to convert between degrees and radians. So if you don't remember how to use dimensional analysis, this will be a good review. So here's an example. Let's convert 210 degrees to radians, and then we're going to leave our answer as a reduced fraction of pi. We start our dimensional analysis method by always writing what we're converting in ratio form. So in this case, we just put it over 1. And then this is how we use that conversion fact. We put one of these sides in the numerator and one of these sides in the denominator. We always choose to place them so that units will cross cancel. So we're trying to get rid of these degree units and we want to end with units of radians. So I purposely placed the 180 degrees in the denominator so that the degrees would cross cancel. And I also want to reduce the fraction. So not only will these degrees cancel, but I also notice that 210 and 180 have a common factor of 30. So if I divide 210 by 30, that leaves me with 7. And if I divide 180 by 30, that leaves me with 6. So now I'm ready to do the multiplication to get my final answer. Multiply everything across the top, and that will give me 7 pi radians. Everything across the bottom will give me a 6. So my final answer will be 7 pi over 6 radians. This is the radian version of 210 degrees. Now let's go the other direction and convert 11 twelfths pi radians into degrees. So we'll start by writing the 11 pi over 12 radians in ratio form. And then we're going to multiply that by a ratio that's formed using this conversion fact up here that 180 degrees is equal to pi radians. And this time I put the pi radians in the denominator so that the radians will cross cancel. And 
also notice that the pi will also cross cancel, which is convenient. And I'm ready to do the multiplication across the top and the bottom, which will give me 1980 over 12. And then my units that are left are degrees, which is what I wanted. And this gives me 165 degrees. So 11 twelfths pi radians is equivalent to 165 degrees. Now let's talk about linear and angular speed. So when you're traveling in circular motion, so imagine this little point on the circle is moving around the circle. So it's moving in circular motion. Then the speed can be measured either as a linear speed or as an angular speed. So linear speed, which we usually use a V to represent, measures the length of the arc, so this arc length here, that is traveled per unit of time. So again, that's a distance that's being changed over time. So the distance that's traveled around the circle over time. And a formula that we can use is V equals the length of that arc divided by T, where S is measured by taking the radius times the angle measure, the central angle here. And it's important to note that the angle measure must be measured in radians for this formula to work out. And then the angular speed, which we usually denote using the Greek letter omega, it's a lowercase omega, measures the angle that is swept in radians per unit of time. So again, how far this, how much this angle is changing over time. This formula is a little bit simpler. We take the angle measure, again measured in radians, and divide it by the time. Now these formulas are given to define linear and angular speeds. It's often more helpful to use dimensional analysis to determine these values in real life applications, as we'll see in the following example. So in this example, a wheel is turning at 425 RPMs, and RPMs means revolutions per minute or rotations per minute, and has a radius of 9 inches. And what we want to do is find the linear speed in feet per minute and the angular speed in radians per second of the wheel. We're going to do the linear speed first, and we're going to use dimensional analysis and use the fact that one revolution and since we're talking about linear speed, we're talking about the linear distance around the circles. So in that case, we're talking about circumference. One revolution would be one circumference. And remember, the formula for circumference is 2 pi r. So we'll start with the 425 revolutions per minute. What we want to do is convert that into a linear speed. And again, we use that fact that one revolution equals 2 pi r. And we'll place the revolutions in the denominator so that those will cancel and then put the 2 pi times the radius, 9 inches, in the numerator. We wanted to find the linear speed in feet per minute, and right now we have inches per minute, so we need one more unit ratio to convert the inches into feet. So we use uh, the fact that one foot equals 12 inches, placing the inches in the denominator so that they will cross cancel. And now we're ready to do the actual calculation multiplying everything that's left across the top, everything that's left across the bottom, and then we'll actually punch this into our calculator. 425 times 2 pi times 9, and then divide that by 12. And so this would round to about 2,002.8 feet per minute. Now let's look at the angular speed. So the angular speed, we want that to be in radians per second. And we can use the fact that in terms of angular measure, one revolution is equal to 2 pi radians. We talked about that earlier. So we'll start off the same with the same ratio, what we're converting, written in ratio form. And this time, we'll put the revolutions in the denominator, but we'll put 2 pi radians in the top since we're trying to get an angular speed. We're interested in the angle measure versus the uh, distance around the circle. And then we need to also convert the minutes into seconds because remember we want the angular speed in radians per second. So then we can cross cancel the minutes because we place the minutes in the numerator in, on purpose so that the minutes can cross cancel. 
and then we multiply everything that's left across the top, everything that's left across the bottom, and then we're ready to punch this into our calculator. 425 times 2 pi divided by 60, and this gives us 45.5 approximately radians per second. So this is how you can calculate linear speed and angular speed.